To talk more about these new concerns sparked by the draft opinion, I want to bring in Amit Paley, CEO of the Trevor Project, an organization that provides assistance to LGBTQ youth, and Tally Weinstein, former federal and state prosecutor in New York and an MSNBC legal analyst. So glad to have both of you here to talk about these important issues. Amit, let me start with just how big your concern is that this potential decision on abortion could be just the beginning that other rights, including same-sex marriages, could be targeted next. There is a great deal of concern about that because this decision, which we should just emphasize, is not a final decision, and we don't know what is going to be at the end. But if the, the same logic that we've seen in this leaked draft comes out, it, it could undermine the constitutional right to privacy on which so many other rights for LGBTQ people uh, have been in part based. That's the Obergefell decision, the Lawrence decision. And we know that LGBTQ people face enormous amounts still of discrimination and rejection and isolation. And so there's a lot of concern that this could lead to an erosion of more rights for LGBTQ people. And Tally, Justice Alito specifically wrote in that leaked draft that this potential abortion decision should not cast doubt on other precedents. But if that's the case, why is there so much fear, not just about obviously L from LGBTQ advocates, but across the board, that this is only the first domino to fall? How do you read this? Well, Chris, that's right. He gives that disclaimer and another one. He says abortion is different from everything because it involves, quote, fetal life. But nonetheless, I agree with Amit that this decision has planted seeds, which if watered and cultivated, could in fact lead to uh, the reversal, the taking away of lots of other rights. Let's, you know, let's talk about same-sex marriage uh, in particular. Uh, Two things have me concerned. One is that the decision says that, you know, part of why Roe was wrongly decided, excuse me, the draft says, is because it's not deeply rooted in the history and traditions of this country. Uh, reading the history and traditions of this country really literally and narrowly, that same logic could apply. And then the other thing, Chris, is that this draft opinion by Justice Alito sounds a lot like the dissent in Obergefell, which was written by Justice Alito, the same logic about history and traditions, the same idea that we should just put this stuff to the states rather than have a nationwide constitutional right. So when you look at it through that lens, are we looking at things indeed like interracial marriage? What are the other concerns that you're hearing within the legal community that could fall under that very broad category? So uh, I've heard concerns from everything to uh, decisions that predated Roe v. Wade, like the decision about contraception, Griswold from 1965, uh, and interracial marriage, loving, uh, all the way through some of these others that involve gay rights and marriage equality. And, you know, I think, Chris, the important thing here, you know, is I, I talked about seeds. I don't think that there is going to be one earthquake after another very soon after the issuing of this decision. But when this kind of insecurity and instability around rights presents, even if it takes a very long time for certain things to play out, I mean, it took 49 years from Roe v. Wade being decided to it being, it looks like, overturned, uh, that's still really uh, very difficult for people whose rights are now vulnerable. It means that states will be emboldened to try out new things, to try out new infringements on rights and see how far they can get, if that's how they're inclined. And I think it also means that people will make different decisions about their lives, uh, not knowing how secure they can feel. Uh, and you know that's why we talk about uh, people relying on Supreme Court opinions as such an important thing to think about um, before a precedent is overruled. I mean, if I, if I could ask you then um, about this bigger picture, which is that you have this startling new mental health survey of LGBT young people from the Trevor Project. I, I mean, it's an understatement to say it paints a difficult picture of the struggles that they have been facing. Some of the findings in the past year, 45% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered attempting suicide. 14% actually went through with an attempt. 73% of LGBTQ youth report experiencing anxiety. 58% depression. I mean, those suicide numbers in particular are are far greater than in the general population.
inflation. I, I want you to dig a little deeper into those numbers, what you think is driving them, but also if you're concerned that there will be new pressures, given what we're seeing from the, the Supreme Court, that could exacerbate the problem. We, we are concerned about that. I think it's important to note LGBTQ people are not born inherently more likely to consider or attempt suicide. The reason that we see these, these really troubling and heartbreaking numbers is because of the discrimination and the rejection and the stigma that LGBTQ people face in society. And these numbers are even higher for transgender and non-binary young people, and they're even higher for LGBTQ youth of color. And so when we see when we see debates in public about people saying, I'm not sure that LGBTQ people deserve the same rights as everyone else, when there are the planting of the seeds, as, as we just discussed, of potentially trying to overturn decisions that have broad-based support in America. I, I think it's important that we just underscore that. Most people in America do not support discrimination against LGBTQ people. Most people support same-sex marriage. Most people support uh, providing support and affirmation to kids. But when we have people in positions of power who are debating the mere existence of LGBTQ people, that has a negative impact on their mental health. And so I hope people can really keep in mind when they use these words in public discourse that young people are listening and that words really do matter. I think this is something obviously we've talked about for a while now, Amit, and, and I think you would also acknowledge that there are unfortunately a lot of people out there who are not going to heed that warning, who don't care, frankly, about that very real concern. So what does everybody else do about it? I mean, obviously, point one is your vote is powerful, right? But what else, Amit? Well, I, I think that there is systemic change that is needed. These policies uh, can be very harmful. We haven't talked about this yet, but across the country in many states, there are people in positions of power targeting LGBTQ young people, and specifically transgender and non-binary young people. They are trying to outlaw and make a felony providing best practice medical care. They're trying to come in between medical providers and parents who are trying to provide care for their children. They're trying to prevent trans children from being able to use the restroom in a safe way. So we, we need to change those policies and we need to make sure that these policies support young people. But I also want people to know some of that systemic change can seem large and overwhelming and maybe hard to know where to start. Every single person can make a difference. One of the most powerful statistics we have from our Trevor Project research is that just having one accepting adult in an LGBTQ young person's life can reduce their risk of suicide by 40%. That's an enormous difference. And every single person who is watching this, who is listening, can be that person. And by just providing love and acceptance and affirmation, you really can make a difference in the lives of LGBTQ youth and help to save lives. Thank you for ending on a positive note and also, I think, giving people power to know that they can do something to, to change. Uh, Amit Paley, thank you. Tali Farhadi and Weinstein, always great to see you as well. Thank you.